Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a great guest today, George Yu. He's the president of the George W. Yu Foundation for Nutrition and Health. Uh, he's also a surgeon based out of Annapolis, Maryland and Washington, D.C., uh, he's been a professor of urology at George Washington University Medical Center and a partner in Aegis Medical and Research Associates for the last 35 years. Uh, he's dedicated his career to understanding the impact and importance of uh, proper nutrition and how the human body responds to different nutrition. So we're going to talk about uh, all of his work. So, George, thanks for coming. Thank you. So as a surgeon, that's clinical practice, but you also have your foundation. How is your time divided between the two? Well, the foundation, I've been in practice of surgery for pelvic and adrenal cancers for 40 years. But the oh, wow. outcome of my surgery was that I uh, took care of, you know, quite a few people. And some of the people who were grateful started the foundation for me because uh, they felt that uh, we needed to shorten or narrow the gap between the science that's developed to the application clinically. So what we do is we speed up what we know is good and solid and then bring it to the clinical arena quickly instead of always waiting for a general consensus, which is oftentimes quite political. Okay, so what, yeah, what happens to research? Um, does so it get stymied? Me... Does it get buried? Like what happens? So what happens in general is that there's about a 10-year gap between the discovery and the application. Just remember, you have to, you know, you have to go through all these people who think differently or think different from you, and you have to form a compromise. You can't just, you know, say that this is the way to go. And this is the way it's in science, you know, the history of science. But because the technology is so good now with your program and all that, people are able to be empowered with all that information instantly. This was not possible 10 years ago. So now we have this opportunity to show people information. Uh, we're not only about nutrition, we're about uh, metabolic aspects of aging and disease. We also handle, we also promote sex hormones in aging and health. We also very interested in rejuvenation of tissues and stem cells. 
And one last thing is that we accumulate so much toxicity in your lifetime that uh, we have a practical way of getting it out. Oh, nice. I was going to joke with you and say there's been no double-blind placebo-controlled study to see if eating keeps people alive or if they need water or, or sleep exactly. to keep them alive. You know, I, think, I think that people overplay this uh, concept of double-blind, randomized. It, you know, penicillin was not done that. It was, the result was so profound that you didn't need a double-blind study. When you blind, it's because results are subtle. And so you had to have controls that are blinded. So mm -hmm. it, it has its place, but I think it's overplayed. Okay. So are there certain conditions that you focus on with a dietary and otherwise approach? Or we call you... it mitochondrial metabolism. What is mitochondria? These are small little cigar-shaped organelles in a cell that was originally derived by evolution from a bacteria. They became incorporated into our bodies, and it's passed on by the female. That's why you have 23andMe. That's why you have Ancestry.com, because they're analyzing this 15,000 genetic material from mitochondria. In a cell, there's only one nucleus, right? Mm -hmm. But in a cell, there might be two to 5,000 mitochondria living. Wow. See, so we believe that nutrition is just a broad term for metabolism. In other words, how does the organism survive? How do they eat? That's the basic science. Of it. And we believe in science. We're not alternative. We're totally science. Well, what is, um, so if I eat something, you know, it goes into my stomach and then my intestines, et cetera. And, you know, what, what is the actual path of me eating something and it getting into my cells? Like, can you trace that whole path in a little bit of detail or I mean, is that I even known? Think, I think most people would know it, but, you know, you masticate, okay? You've got teeth to masticate and it goes into your stomach. The stomach is a reservoir of very acid uh, media. The media gets digests and breaks food down at, at first level. It will take care of protein. It would even take care of starch. In fact, while your stomach is young, you can absorb vitamins like B vitamin, you know, folic acid. As you get old, those things don't work anymore. The next stage is the small bowel. And that's where the action really takes place because uh, the digestive enzyme, which ages also as you get old, your function isn't quite as good. That's why a person 70 year old cannot eat a Big Mac and feel good afterward. He can't. He doesn't have the juices. So the juices break it down further from the stomach, and it's not acid, but now it's alkaline. And once it gets through that, it breaks it down further. And for fats, you have bile that emulsifies the fat, breaks it into smaller pieces, and then lets the enzymes break it, okay? Once the enzymes break it into the smaller units, it gets absorbed in the small bowel, and the small bowel encompasses right after the stomach, which we call the duodenum, then the ileum, then the jejunum, okay, before it goes into right. the large bowel. The large bowel basically is the finished part of digestion. By that time, a lot of it has been absorbed, okay? So it goes into your bloodstream. Here's what I think is missing. So, okay, stuff gets broken down in the stomach and then the small intestine, and then end of story. But... Where does it go once it's absorbed so, in the small intestine? Like, does it into travel your, through interstitium or blood? Like, how does it get to yeah, cells? It into and your then once it gets to a cell, how does it enter? So it goes into your blood and the different pieces, it's a very complex, but basically, let me just take one example of sugar, okay? The sugar gets uh, brought into the cell by glute transporters. They go through the first breakdown, which called glycolysis. And the cancers can do that. The fungus can do that. Okay. But you're more sophisticated. You next go into the breakdown of sugar. You get a couple of units of what we call the energy ATP. Okay. The ATP is a package powerhouse, which the body com converts sugar into. Now 
it goes into the mitochondria for the second stage, whereas you only got two, you know, now you're going to get 36 ATPs by going through these small cigar-shaped particles, you know, organelles, we call it. And they go through a cascade of what we know and every college student and high school student knows. It's called the Krebs cycle. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. A respiration. If you cannot go through respiration, you will not live, okay? What's so interesting is that cancers, 90% of them eat sugar at first only. It's a unique piece. It's like a mold. We call it fermentation. That's what we, glycolysis. It's just a breakdown of sugar and it's very basic, but it never goes through the more sophisticated organelle through mitochondria. Okay, so in normal cells, all the energy harvesting happens inside the mitochondria only. So no, materials will be transported part, into the cell. and then no, the first part goes in the cell and you get two ATPs. It breaks the sugar down. And then from that, the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria for the big, okay. for the big source. You see, so okay. what, what we learn is interesting. I try to put that in besides the cancer is in Alzheimer's, the brain uses sugar, of course, is that first preference, but the brain cannot live without sugar, without going into a form of deterioration, all right? Oxygen and sugar. The problem with Alzheimer's is that 10 years before you lose your memory, there's a defect maybe at menopause, hormonal maybe, but there's an enzyme that takes the sugar breakdown part and puts it into the mitochondria, and it can't do that because it has a defective pyruvate dehydrogen. So this is a discovery that was made uh, a while back, but the correlation between the female higher incidence of Alzheimer's and hormones and this enzyme defect has only been, you know, recently elucidated in 10 years. So now what do you do? You can't use the mitochondria anymore, right? So the brain starts deteriorating, and 10 years later, you have an Alzheimer's case. So in, in cancer, I've heard that mitochondria are damaged. Are they damaged, or for some they're reason, is there just no... Effective. It's not the same. If you look at mitochondria, it looks like a cigar-shaped little organelle with little twists inside. If you look at our youfoundation.org, we have a cartoon that makes it so explicit that we want every high school to understand. The mitochondria of a cancer cell begins to change from little bit to extreme, okay? So when I was at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Peterson showed me the electron microscopy, not regular microscopy, shows you how abnormal these mitochondria are and how the cancer cells rely 90% on sugar because it's a much simpler way to get fuel, okay? And and you heard of the test that we call PET scan. Have you ever heard of that, PET scan? Yes. PET scan is nothing more than finding out how much sugar is going into a cell, and it's an isotope called fluorodeoxyglucose. And in cancer, it lights up like a lightning. In breast cancer, it's just all over. You know, it's bright orange, okay? And people don't know that. And many doctors are just beginning to appreciate that. And this was discovered in 1978 and earlier. You see what I mean? So going back to the mitochondria, though, so that's great. You have that cartoon on your website. But in a cancer cell, 
what happens to the mitochondria and why are they, do they just become ineffective or do materials not even get to them to be processed? No, they don't get to them. They don't get to them well. Okay. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So what happens? You can have a carcinogen. Okay. You can have radiation. You can have aging. You can have hormonal changes. All these are insults. The mitochondria is very sensitive to insults, okay? And your nucleus is stronger, but the mitochondria are very vulnerable to change. For instance, if you have less and less oxygen, the body says, okay, how do we adapt, okay? And one of the cells that adapt is cancer. So the the Nobel Prize winning work was done this uh just recently uh, just awarded this last year and it's called HIF hypoxic inducing factor and it was uh you know it was a major discovery and you know the thing is we discovered that all cells have that ability all cells have the ability to adapt and if it's an injury external injury aging hormones the mitochondria starts changing and it starts becoming defective, okay? So as it becomes defective, you might have a clone of cells that said, oh, by the way, uh, we have a very nice situation. We can eat sugar and uh, we don't need the mitochondria. So in a cancer cell, you have not only the ability to take a lot of sugar uh, as a fuel, and there's other things, of course, but in the mitochondria itself, they have a defect called hexokinase 2, discovered by one of my mentors, Peter Peterson, you see. So these mitochondria begin to change and a clone of it becomes a cancer. That's to put it as simply as possible. So when you look at cancer cells, does the does most of the cellular material look normal? It's just the mitochondria are defective or is no, the entire cell? Uh, so we say it's the first step of injury. The nucleus is what we focused on, okay? The DNA of the nucleus that we've been focusing on. But that may not be the first step. The first step is a defect in the mitochondria, which interacts with the nucleus. So what does it look like? First of all, the shape of it is not symmetrical. It's very abnormal look. And what makes the shape of a cell? The membrane. Membranes made up of what we call phosphatidylcholine and cholesterol. It's abnormal, okay? If you look at the nucleus, it looks very big and dark. And so on plain microscopy, we call it H and E, you could see that. But plain microscopy cannot see mitochondria because it's too small. So we've missed it. I, I gave a talk once and I titled it, If Only I Could Have Seen the Mitochondria. How big are the mitochondria, by the way? What's their average size? Oh, just think of a cell. All right. I mean, just to give you an, a cell is tiny, right? There's so is a there's, cell what, like a hundred microns or how wide is a cell and how wide I'm is a I'm not microns? sure, right? You know, I don't have it in front of me, but you could okay. look it up in Google. But can you imagine 5,000 mitochondria in one cell? Yeah. I and mean, when you said that, I was like, wow, they and must be really sperm, tiny. It... Why is it that the it's transferred by the female? Because the sperm only has about two to four to, to uh, move okay. the sperm forward, you see? Okay. So it's the female which passes on the bulk of those mitochondria. Okay. Uh, It's a side note. Do you know if anyone knows what happens to the few mitochondria that a successful sperm that fertilizes the egg? You know, do they do they die? Do they get incorporated? They they do die because uh, the sperm's job is to flagellate into the vagina and into the cervix impregnate. That's it. That's okay. I just wondered if they stayed, but there was a predominance of, you know, the uh, the woman's mitochondria and the no, man's. No, it's all, it's all, all, most, it's all female. Okay. It's only two or three, and it's only for motility. But do you know anything about the biogenesis of mitochondria? Like, do they do they divide uh, just like cells do? Like, how do they yes, work? Yes, created? They, they fuse, they break down, they die. Uh, you heard of bat brown adipose tissue? Yes. Okay. When you're born, you have lots of this brown fat behind your neck and then your back because the baby is so susceptible to changes in energy and temperature that you have to have that. What is brown fat is mitochondria-loaded fat cells, okay? 
as you grow, it dissipates. But if you go into the cold, you can get it back. So if there's one form of exercise you should do is ice skate, swim, because you will build up cold brown fat as okay. energy source. And it makes white fat dissipate. So if you got a load yeah. of fat in your belly and you got brown fat, you're going to use it up. Now I'm using, you know, layman's terms. It's simple. But the interesting thing about brain is that it has to have plenty of energy. It's, it's only 5% of your body and it takes up a quarter of all your energy for the whole day. So when you have a defect in the mitochondria of the brain cell, then things go bad. Okay. But it's okay. gradual. We see that PET scans show poor uptake of sugar in brain cells 10 years before they lose their memory. So what's the alternative? The alternative is a major discovery made by many people. And when I was in medical school, George Cahill at Harvard was uh, the one who said, what happens if we have an alternative, right? What do we do if we starve? Well, a caveman starves three days and then gets a meal a feast for one day. So how do they live? Well, they use fat as their main fuel. Why is fat so good? Because fat is lighter than muscle. If you have muscle as fuel, you can't move, but fat is easy to carry. So by evolution, it's a wonderful source of stored fuel. You see, it's a totally different way of looking at life from an evolutionary standpoint, from a cosmetics. Okay. okay. So the Arnold Schwarzenegger types who have heavy, they're not great athletes. You know why? It's too heavy, too much muscle. They can't coordinate quickly. They look like a Hulk, but they're not useful, mm, right? Okay. You've seen that. So the idea was strong, lean with uh, you want bad reserves. You light, lean, strong, not bulky. What is bulky muscle? It's nothing but glycogen stored in muscle with four molecules of water. It's watery muscle. I used to work on a ranch, and one of the things we always knew was which cattleman and which ranch was cheating by feeding the cattle water and hormones. Because when you took their steak and you put it in a frying pan, it splattered because the water was in it. See, these are all things that people see, but they don't understand it. So that's the part that that uh, is so important is that a discovery of how the mitochondria works from electron microscopy to its functions have opened up the doors to Alzheimer's, cancer, so forth. Well, what about diabetes? I would think that's intimately that's, related to both, right? In diabetes, it's another subset of sugar and the insulin, which is outside, not properly getting in. So uh, diabetes type two, you know, right? You've seen that. They're heavy, yes. big loaded belly, heavy men and women. Diabetes type one is inherited, not inherited, but early onset, probably from action maybe, uh, but they're not heavy people. Diabetes type three is Alzheimer's. So in diabetes... Do you, do you think that, that um, Alzheimer's precedes... Well, I mean, it doesn't, obviously, but what, if, if someone is heavy and they're having a lot of sugar, and they're headed towards diabetes, what do you think is happening on the brain side of things? Do you think that's acting in advance of it, or is it a lagging indicator of, of problems? I'm not sure I can answer that, but I would say that the diabetes type 2 is generally accepted is that the they have insulin resistance because the insulin cannot push the cell in uh, the sugar into okay? They just can't. Does insulin resistance happen at the exterior cell membrane or does it happen at the mitochondrial cytoplasm interface? Uh, exterior. I'm sure there are more, but the general acceptance is that the insulin cannot dispose the sugar in the cell. Now, if you have a lot of muscle, one of the, the advantages of being muscular is that you can eat a lot because the muscle absorbs sugar very well. It's called the glucose disposal rate. And that's why young muscular fellas can eat a lot of junk food and still feel great. Okay. As you age, the pancreas also ages. And so people think diabetes is just the insulin 
resistance. No, it has a lot to do with the pancreas also aging, not being able to function properly to making sure that they have a steady ability to push the sugar into the cell. For instance, a 20-year-old can eat all the junk food they want. Their sugar will go all the way up to 300, and within one hour, it's back down to 90. Whereas you, how old are you now? Well, I'm in my mid-40s, and I remember those days when I used to be able to eat anything, no problem. So you're in the next stage, and I'm 73, and I'm in the third stage. So I have seen my pancreas work not as well. How do I know that? Now we have what we call the uh, uh, computer uh, iPod or iPhone monitored glucose levels, right? So one company that did it was Abbott, and they call it the Free Libra 14, in which you could put this patch on your arm, you, you could read your sugars 14 days straight every second. It's not really getting your blood sugar but it's getting all that sugar that's diffusing all over your body, all over your eyes, all over your organ, and into the subcutaneous fat tissue. And let's say the reading is 100. Well, guess what? Your real sugar is 120. So it's a game changer. Now you're going to see how bad your food you're eating is doing to you. It's flooding you with sugar. Why is so sugar so popular? and so? Because it tastes good. It tastes very good. It's more addictive than cocaine. So knowing what you know, what are some of the strategies that you've come up with to help people that uh, have cancer or Alzheimer's, they're starting to see signs, what what can you do? So you heard of ketogenic diet, right? Yes. Okay. What does that mean? It just means you're using a different kind of fuel. Instead of using sugar and carbohydrates, you're switching to a fatty acid. What are the fatty acids? that are most efficient. First of all, let me correct you one thing that the public doesn't understand. Fat does not make you fat. It's the sugar and carbohydrate, okay? So when you eat a fat, it's a very complex fuel. First of all, it's tough to break down and it's much more efficient than sugar. So what do we call ketogenic uh, optimal foods? Coconut oil. As opposed to what Ansel Keys said, that it was bad for your heart, we think coconut oil, which is a medium chain fatty acid, meaning from carbon six all the way to 12, are easy, basically easy to break down. In fact, one of the biggest popular fatty acid is carbon, uh, carbon eight, caprylic acid, used by all bodybuilders. When they take that oil, they can show their abs. If they mm. eat two bananas before the meat the next day, they can't see the abs. So what do they okay. do? They have to have energy. So one of the energies is using fatty acid. And I alluded to Dr. George Cahill at the Joslin Clinic when I was in Boston. And he said, what kind of fuels can we use? Well, he coined it as ketone ester. And one of my best colleagues and friends who just passed is Richard Veach, who dedicated his life to working on the Krebs cycle and then finding the end product, ketone ester, which is D for David, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the end product of all ketogenic diets. And this is the alternative fuel for your brain and your heart. It's fantastic. Okay. Okay. And the cancers can't eat it in the beginning. So. Oh, but they evolved to eat it later on? They, they, yes, there's two schools of thought. And my mentor, Dr. Peterson, uh, he wrote a credible piece of work in 1978 showing that little by little, they can adapt. And that's why, uh, you know, these cells have that ability. Uh, when do they adapt and how do they adapt? And what's the consequence of that? Well, you get consequence. The, the cancer starts eating everything. So you've seen cachexic patients. They lose their fat, they lose their muscle, right? Because now the the cancer has adapted in every way, not only using sugar. By the way, they can also use an amino acid. So for all the protein lovers, glutamine is very important for your body, but the cancers have learned to eat it also as an alternative. In fact, I have a very good friend in California, Julia Ross. She said, if you give 
15, 1,500 milligrams of glutamine, you'll lose your taste with sugar. That's right, because it's taking the place of sugar. If someone you know, has cancer and they, they adopt a ketogenic diet, will that hasten the adaptation of the cancer to be able to use other fuels or no? Well, no and yes. First of all, when you do a PET scan, it shows that they're eating sugar like crazy, right? So you stop eating sugar, and that's what we call calorie restriction. And I've been a great follower of calorie restriction since I was in medicals. And calorie restriction is the only biological phenomenon that's true for worms all the way up to maybe primates and humans in that they live longer. They don't get as many diseases. They're skinny as a rail, but they are healthy. Now, what's wrong with just calorie restrictions? There's some side of it. And therefore, the people who follow Roy Wolford, and you may have heard of Biosphere 2 in Arizona. Yeah, I visited it many years ago. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. It's the most expensive human study in the world, sponsored by the Hunt brothers, the Hunt Silver brothers, because they were preparing for outer space living. And Roy Wolford used a calorie-restricted fuel, and he analyzed the, the eight people, four men and four women in that period, and all, they all, the, all the parameters became younger, okay? As soon as they came out, they became the old self that they were. So calorie restriction is a scientific phenomenon that's been studied for over 70 years since uh, Cleve McClay, a K of Cornell in which he said that when you limit the number of calories, you all, uh, all your body will revert to a younger age. Uh, Steven Spindler, who I work with, said 15,000 genes will change to a younger stage in two weeks. Now, so what happens? How are you going to, you're going to be hungry all the time, right? You're living longer, but you're hungry. So the alternative fuel that the body automatically shifts to its fat. So fat is the ketogenic diet. So when you do calorie restriction, you are going into ketosis without even taking any. So what was the adaptation? Because, you know, like your thyroid hormone goes bad when on calorie is too long, all your sex hormones go away. Many of the men would tell me, God, my libido is completely. Oh, really? Bad. Yeah. So what, what, is the what is the alternative modern day adaptation when you have a refrigerator full of food you're never going to stop right so right. what do people do people like volta longo in california has been pushing overnight fasting right many cultures the muslims do it uh, ramadan the catholics do it but fasting is a kind of a modern way of doing calorie restriction short term, but that even helps. Okay, for instance, you mean like we, inter intermittent fasting helps? You're saying? Yeah, you, that's what you heard about that you read about in every magazine you can think of. But it's nothing new. It's just an adaptation to calorie restriction. It's a it's a modern form for people who have four refrigerators full of food. Okay, so I mean, oh. keep going. So intermittent fasting, right? It does I work. Mean, okay, it does work, but it started long time ago. But what you have to understand is that this losing, not using as much food makes the body protect itself and say, well, I guess it's not time to reproduce and perhaps we should just repair. So the paradigm of survival of the species is reproduced. So spring, reproduction, lots of food, okay? Winter, bad scenario, starvation. So this is an ongoing sine flux cycle that happens in man. But now we have one problem. We have way too much. Okay, so why does ketone esters fit in? Because now we have the molecule, the end product, and we can give it to people even without doing calorie restriction and without doing fasting and without eating fat. But that's not a great way to do it. It's much healthier to use a lot more fats and people always say olive oil. Well, I don't agree with that. I think medium chain fatty acids from coconut oil, from medium chain fatty triglycerides are very good and very good. 
it makes you lose weight because you're not hungry. So this okay. is the so, modern okay. version of dieting, you might say, or a form of limiting an excess and food that are mostly carbohydrate. Would would a protocol for um to you know stave off Alzheimer's look the same as to stave off diabetes as to also reduce cancer risk and tumor progression, or are they different? Well, yes, the, you you hit on a good concept. That's correct. Yes, in fact, just to give credit to everybody, the first concept. Uh, first of all, let me just say Otto Warburg in in the forties in Germany. Uh, who actually won the Nobel Prize said cancers eat different kinds of uh, eat eat a different kind of food, but that was the beginning of it. And the second thing that happened was that we realized that people who have epilepsy, especially a pediatric version of it, who could not stop the epilepsy, could be stopped with a ketogenic diet. Aha! It's feeding the cells, right? You heard this before. This is. It will work, and this has been around for also about 70 years. Okay, so so not only is this a wonderful fuel for the brain, but it's already been practiced for a long time among mainly little kids with epilepsy. So this is nothing new. So now you can apply it to diabetes, you can apply it to uh, Alzheimer's disease, you can apply it to cancer. How wonderful, right? Okay, right. Yep. So this is a major breakthrough. This well, you're saying though that cancers adapt and they're able to use more and more different course, types of, of fuel. Course. So what do you do that's if, if, if what, what what do you do if you're on a ketogenic diet and the cancer reduces, but then it starts to to surge of again? Course, what do you do? It, it, it will happen. That's why, just like in the curing of AIDS, you have to have a cocktail. You have to use many different ways. I'm a great believer in chemotherapy because being a urological cancer surgeon, I have seen the poster child of testicular cancer being totally cured no matter where it goes. But that's one of the few poster childs of chemotherapy and surgery. Okay. So what what do you do when it doesn't work? Well, for for, uh, testicular cancer, it does work, but many other cancers don't work. So you have to use a cocktail. So when you fight a war, you don't just send in the troops. You cut off their water supply, you cut off their food, you give them dysentery, you fight a war in the winter like Russia did against Napoleon, right? It's the same thing. You have to use a cocktail. It's not one drug that will be, be the magic bullet. You understand what I'm saying? I understand. So you're saying, uh, let's you say can't, you, you can't just it. use uh, one thing and think that you're going to cure everything. No, because cells can adapt. So if you had pancreatic cancer, what would be the protocol that you would think would be ideal? Well, it's not, uh, it depends on how, you know, pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma is two very PET scan positive cancer. You can see it on PET scan that they have sugar inside <laughs> cancer cells, right? So you would use, you would use surgery, you would use chemotherapy, but you will also use a metabolic mitochondria intervention that we've been talking. Why not? Okay. Yeah, no, no, right, right. Right? And th- that's, this is the only thing where you can implement it yourself. Now, well, have you observed patients that, uh, you know, that are using every approach possible and, and, you know, what's happened to them? I know every patient is different, but, you know, wh- how, how efficacious of is course, it to use Or else I wouldn't be talking. You know, I've been using calorie restrictions since 1990s, okay? But it doesn't mean you... You win the price every time. Each one thing I learned from dealing with sex hormones: one shoe never fits anybody. You have what we call genetic polymorphism. In other words, everybody's different. You're a little bit different, and so you have to use a tailor-made cocktail for testicular cancer. You just need surgery and chemotherapy. That's it, because it cures mostly. But most of the cancers don't cure that way. And you mentioned. One pancreatic cancer. The surgery is heroic, beautiful surgery, but doesn't mean they're going to live. Glioblastoma is the same thing. We see many second opinions where a patient would have his tumor resected oh, immediately, but they're tentacles and they come back, right? So you have to find other ways to do it. 
some of the metabolic blocking agents, which I did not mention, actually attack or act like a Trojan horse for the glucose receptor. Uh, one of them is uh, 2-deoxyglucose, which is what we use as a dye for the PET scan. Fluorodeoxyglucose. It, it, it's not sugar. It's a deoxyglucose with a fluoro next to it. It gets stuck on the cell, right? So right. now what, how are you going to get rid of it? You can't get rid of it anymore, right? So the cancers don't like that because you trick them into something. And a lot of drugs that we use today are what we call analogs of the real thing. Fluoroxyglucose to cancer cells. Mm -hmm. They take it in, but what, they can't get rid of it? Can they use it for respiration? What happens to it? No, they can't because it's not glucose, okay? So what happens if you load them up with this over time and you give multiple doses? What will happen to them? Well, (laughs) the deoxyglucose, some of it will get into your normal cells too. In fact, when I was uh, talking to one of the old doctors from Johns Hopkins, when uh, he was from Germany and he went to Wahlberg and he Evidently, they had used deoxyglucose, and the, the the when they tried it, they immediately stopped because the patient got so weak <laughs> because it was affecting all the other cells. So it's not that these molecules don't go to other cells. It's just the sh- cancers perf- want the sugar so badly. They have a lot more glut receptor on the cancer cell cell membrane. So they prefer. Okay. See what I mean? So your right. poor, your so yeah the other the uh the other one that's uh, that we're working on is three bromopyruvate another analog of pyruvic acid again a knockout okay like a knockout club golf club so it goes in there and poisons the cancer hmm, okay a, yeah I've heard of three I've heard of three BP I guess that's what it's called for short right yeah three bromopyruvate it's just a bromo with a pyruvate so. You know, that was discovered in my mentor's laboratory, Pete Peterson, by Dr. Yang Ko. Okay. And she's going all over the world right now, taking care of people and looking at the clinical trials. Uh, it, as you know, it costs between 30 and 50 million becomes a drug. So who has that money? Who's going to sponsor that? And I thought it was up to a billion, not 30, 50 million. Probably. But the thing is, not only do you have the financial part, but Think of all the other drugs that's going to sit on the side. You know, my feeling is you could use both. You know, I'm a, I'm a surgeon. I believe in surgery, but you don't say only surgery. You say surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, metabolic therapy. It's a cocktail. See? Got it. Okay. So it's just like fighting a war. You don't win a war just sending the troops. You got to use the air, airplanes. You got to use the bombs. You got to use all kinds of stuff and. The, the biggest one in the old days was given sickness, right? People died from infections more than a bullet. Got it. Okay. So that's the approach that I try to explain to people why I felt after 40 years of doing oncological care, both surgery and watching their chemotherapy and watching their radiation, that you need a cocktail and not single one or two agents. You need to attack it from all sides. and the, there are people who survived, and of course I have some too, who use this cocktail approach. And one of them is uh, Ben Williams, a, psych- a psychologist who had a brain cancer, and he lived, and he wrote a book. Okay. Mm, right. And another one is Jane McClellan in England. She had oh, I've spoken to her, yeah. Yeah. So you know, here she is. Uh, she's she's science based, but she was not a physician. But she start said hey, listen, my chances are bad. I'm going to look for any alternatives instead of saying, go ahead and do what you want, right? right? Yeah. So so that's the revolution of information. And our foundation wants to promote that. We want people to know what's going on from high school on. We, we're we trying to use the same methodology that Max used, giving Mac computers to little kids. We want high school kids to tell their parents, Cancer starts from the mitochondria. You know what that is? No, let me tell you. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Well, very good, George. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, since this is so important, what, where can people go to find out more? Well, the first thing you can use, you know, is the digital. 
the youfoundation.org. I'd, I'd encourage you to get the Toot Conference. We, we, <laughs> we spent half a million dollars digitizing everything. And you can get 100 hours of chefs, researchers, medical doctors, all in one room, digitized. And you pay 30 bucks and you get the whole thing in your living room. How do you like that? So you have the ability to empower yourself if you want to. Okay, very good. All right, George. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. And I really appreciate your approach and, and your information. You're welcome. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.